the 802.11, the Bluetooth and Zigbee, and each of them have a different channel structure, different uh, scheme for uh, file MAC transmissions. And essentially what their own standard defines is, is a way of uh, uh, interacting with another uh, device of the same kind. But uh, due to the way these standards are written, uh, gradually and, and orthogonal to each other. Uh, they, they don't have any scheme of cooperation between one another. So the problem statement uh, for this research is essentially, is it possible to uh, diagnose multi-radio interference by only using passive uh, schemes? And by diagnose, we mean uh, uh, if there is a radio, if there is a radio of another kind present, uh, when you are also transmitting, uh, can you classify what kind of radio is that? And can you tell the user uh, that your problem is due to multi-radio uh, interference compared to something else? So just to motivate it further, I uh, have a couple of quick examples from daily life. Uh, so this first uh, case, uh, you're on a Skype call and you're using the Bluetooth as the last uh, uh, input output device. So what's happening here is since the Bluetooth transmitter receiver in your laptop is placed very close to your Wi-Fi uh, card in your laptop, uh, whenever there's a Wi-Fi uh, reception and a Bluetooth transmission at the same time, since they are on the overlapping set of frequencies, they uh, interfere with each other and there's a perceptible uh, uh, decrease in the quality uh, of voice uh, and also the Wi-Fi throughput. So we'll uh, uh, analyze things like this in more detail using the orbit test bed uh, as we move along. So a more critical example is if you have uh, Zigbee-based uh, intrusion detection or fire alarm system in your house and you also have these green uh, connections which, uh, which show uh, uh, streaming video kind of uh, uh, devices. So if you have a set-top box which streams uh, videos, high bandwidth videos to your TV. So uh, what we have seen uh, is the, these high, uh, high bandwidth videos can really kill the uh, low power Zigbee devices and in case of a critical uh, alarm, uh, those uh, alarms could be missed and that's like a, uh, a critical problem. So in this situation we would like to sense whether uh, this kind of a uh, overpowering uh, 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 interference is there or not. Uh, and the interference could actually be out from outside your own home. So if your neighbor, for example, has a uh, baby monitor or wireless uh, video surveillance uh, cameras, uh, then their continuous streaming can interfere with your Wi-Fi receptions. And, and since those devices are not even in your control or your visibility, you, you won't be able to know what is wrong with your Wi-Fi source. So these are the kind of uh, motivational uh, pictures that we have and we want to diagnose this, these kind of scenarios. Uh, so the way we uh, did, the, did this research is, uh, is of a more hands-on and data-centric view. So on the left, we have a number of uh, diagnosis tools that we either reuse or uh, in some cases we make new uh, tools uh, according to our needs. So what these tools are is essentially ways in which we can see the wireless environment from a multiple point of view. So for example, we have 802.11 probing. Uh, so there's a promiscuous mode in, in the 802.11 standard which we use to receive all packets, not only a trace to itself, but uh, all the packets in there. For, and similarly, we have a, a, a ways in which we can see Bluetooth uh, spectrums, Bluetooth transmissions, Zigbee transmissions, and we also play around with a, a low-cost spectrum analyzer. For our experiment, we use a, a GNU radio setup, but we can uh, potentially do the same thing using a $100 uh, low-cost spectrum analyzer. So what we have after getting data from these sets of uh, input uh, methods, we, we collect that uh, and integrate it into a central server framework. Uh, we uh, 
we change some of the ways in which they, these uh, existing tools behave so as to port into a framework structure for which we reuse the OML library that uh, we have in MinLab. And these, these sets of data go into a diagnosis inference algorithm uh, phase, which also gets input from emulation data that we have collected from Orbit. So the idea is you you emulate certain scenarios. Uh, you collect so collect the the values or the thresholds of the parameters of interest. And from the online set, if you see a similar kind of a characterization of the parameters, you can diagnose uh, the problems. Uh, you can say that this is uh, problem X is occurred because uh, the current data set is, matches our uh, past experiments and so on. And if you do have a control channel of some sort in which you can tell the other uh, interfering device to, to either manage its transmission or turn it down for a while, then we can do that. Otherwise, uh, at least the user can get to know that this is something wrong. So the, the interfered, the, the main link which you want uh, to monitor, you can change its own channel or power or things like that. So we basically focus uh, on this part, on the uh, how to develop the tools, how to integrate them, and how to get the algorithms. The uh, How to use that diagnostic algorithm uh, is something we haven't uh, done a lot on in this project. So uh, coming to the details, uh, uh, made this presentation in three uh, uh, distinct parts. So first, we will see a few examples of uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, uh, characterization of the problem. So in case of uh, 802.11, Bluetooth, Zigbee, and uh, all combinations of, of such sort, uh, what is the exact uh, amount of interference in different scenarios which occur commonly. Uh, next up, we'll see what are the tools we developed for this. I'll give a couple of specific examples for that. And lastly, we'll see some uh, basic diagnosis algorithm examples. So coming to the first part, uh, the problem uh, exploration part. So this is one of the experiments that we did uh, in the orbit test bed. Uh, so in this case, it's intra 802.11 interference that we were looking at. So in this set of experiments, we have uh, two links, uh, link one and link two. and. Uh, the distance between these two links is about six meters, and uh, the experiment goes uh, as as says that uh, we vary the link two uh, data rate, and we keep the link one data rate fixed, uh, and we observe that just by uh, varying at what speed is your neighboring link transmitting at, that affects your own link. So here we have. Uh, Three cases, 11B, when both cases, both of the links are 802.11B, in one case it's 11G, 11B, and the other is both 11G. So the first, second column here shows uh, when the link 2 is transmitting at 11 Mbps. So this is the link 2 that uh, we are varying, and link 1 is what we are measuring. So the throughput results is for link 1. Uh, we see that as we move from link to 11 Mbps from column 2 to link to 1 Mbps, column 3, the throughput of link 1 falls down drastically. Even though link 1 has done nothing different, link 1 is absolutely uh, separated from the operations of link 2. But just the fact that it's transmitting slowly and it's hogging more of your channel, that's why link 1 is uh, suffering in its throughput. So that's one of the cases that we covered. Uh, the other uh, set of experiments that we did was through 802.11 Bluetooth experiment, uh, interference experiment. So in this set, uh, the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, uh, the Bluetooth transmitter and the Wi-Fi receiver are co-located in the orbit node. Uh, and here we have shown it as a 25 mm distance, which is on the orbit node. That is the distance between the antennas. And the Wi-Fi transmitter, we, we vary the distance. So essentially what happens is uh, the reception at the Wi-Fi 
is is uh, interfered with by the transmissions of the Bluetooth, which is there right there at the receiver. And as this uh, transmitter moves away, the reception quality at the Wi-Fi receiver falls down gradually. So, so the plots for this is it, it looks like this. So the upper two lines are for A to two dot eleven G, and the uppermost in that is when there is no Bluetooth interference. And so that part is not there, just you are moving this transmitter away. So that's the distance between the transmitter and receiver. So we see there is a gradual fall. But if there is Bluetooth, there, there is a uh, uh, substantial difference in the throughputs that you observe. So there is a certain constant almost fall. And uh, as you go down to, uh, to a large distance, say of 15 or about meters, uh, the throughput that you get is quite unre uh, quite unusable. Uh, but if you did not have the Bluetooth, there, then we have still an 8 Mbps throughput. Uh, in case of A to 2.11b, which is shown by these two bottom lines, we see that it is affected by distance to a much less extent uh, as compared to A to 2.11g. That's because of the inherent nature of uh, uh, the standard that it uses, it uh, relies on a more uh, uh, robust uh, uh, phi scheme with which it can only transmit slowly up to a max 11 Mbps, but the distance variability is much less. But even in that case, we see a certain fall as we increase the uh, distance between the transmitter and receiver in case of Bluetooth interference. So uh, moving on, so we. Uh, I think is that one data point. I think it's an oddball. Uh, the light blue. Yeah. It bounces up from 12 to 14. It seems like uh, so. This uh, even this one was through like uh, five runs, I suppose. But somehow it averaged out to be that curve. Uh, it's always uh, uh, possible that orbit test bed during that time there was some other transmissions or <coughs> things like that so it might have mm, creeped into so the... So it looks like actually it's the one at 11 that's too low. Uh, yeah, it seems like. That has gone down. It seems. Troubles with real... So how long, how long did it, does it... Does it does an experiment run the data? So uh, this particular set is <coughs> for a 60 seconds uh, continuous measurement of throughput while the all the links are on. So and that we repeat for multiple times for multiple distances. Well, so at 11, it's you repeated it for five times yeah. for the distance of 11. So there are different nodes. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, actually one yeah, one. so. When we move the distance, we are not physically moving the same device. We are using a different node. Uh -huh. So there is yeah, that is probably the main. So there could be some receiver centric. Like, so so at, at any one distance, it's always the same device that you repeat the experiment on. Yeah, it's one of the nodes, so it's like the same node that. We So, so did you, um, is it that each one of those in the sequence has a Bluetooth transmitter that you activate? Yeah, so in this case we only use, like the Bluetooth transmitter was fixed. Uh, so we need, we took one node which had both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi trans uh, uh, chips. So the Bluetooth transmitter stays there and this Wi-Fi transmitter, oh, we yeah, changed yeah. the oh. transmitter so that that moves along. It's not even surprised that the results are so steady. Each time it's more transparent. There's something more different than the dome is correct. Yeah, those are. I mean, the transmitters are they you know they nominally from the same power, but they don't really. So so is that fluctuation just the different transmitters all set to the same power level? So, so you didn't have any kind of uh, See, my, my issue power is I don't measure. think he may have, this may be, this might have been his experimental setup, but I have 
There's no reason to believe that there were no other radios that were doing whatever. So this, uh, at least... No, but, but even... They still, may not have been part of the orbit grid, but, but there may have been other things around here, right? Right, but he's saying each one of those distances is a different transfer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, you're yeah, nominally yeah. putting the same power, right? But reality, you know, is, you know what they, what they transfer. All right. So, <clears throat> in this one uh, last set of results that I wanted to show is, uh, is the one in which we characterize kind of the the multitude of the normal environment that we have right now. So in this case, we have 802.11b nodes, G nodes, Bluetooth, and Zigbee. So uh, in this chaos, you can see somehow that it might characterize the way uh, uh, urban locality uh, uh, looks like in terms of the wireless standards. You can have your own house access point with connect to maybe three devices in some rooms and you have some Zigbee uh, relays or monitors located throughout your house and then you have some neighboring access points that your neighbors are using and so on. So this is a t uh, kind of characterization of uh, this small home environment and the main point for this experiment was more to uh, motivate the kind of uh, interference problems there are rather than measuring exactly what is the uh, throughput impact due to each kind of interference. Because we, in this case, we can't really track down what uh, is interfering with what uh, in a precise way. That we did with, with individual pairwise experiments. And this is more of a general feel of there is a huge impact on the throughputs when all these interferences add up. So this plot shows uh, the percentage of nominal throughput for each link. So first we operate each link uh, by itself without any interference, and then we have all the links uh, operating at once. So this this uh, essentially shows uh, that the the throughputs are cut by starting from 30 percent, going all the way to uh, 90 percent for some links. So uh, depending on the location of the link and the amount of interfering uh, and the type of interfering device near it, each link. Uh, each each link has suffered about 70, 60 or uh, more uh, percentage of its throughput. So that's the sort, that's the flavor of some of the interference measurement experiments that we were doing. So you can plot at the Zigbee here, you just gave the number? Yeah, so Zigbee, the problem is the way we uh, uh, we measure that is uh, we have a, a packet arrival, a packet reception or no reception, uh, the way the software <coughs> for the Zigbee nodes are run. So uh, essentially we can uh, do a similar kind of a thing but uh, combining all the uh, receiving nodes of Zigbee since we have so many uh, Zigbee nodes, overall we uh, added up all the number of packets that uh, were received and to see what was the loss ratio. We can probably draw a similar bar chart which shows the throughput. So, so what is the definition of nominal throughput? Nominal throughput is when we run only that link and no other link in the, in the setup is running. And here packet reception is the same as a correct packet? Yes, in Zigbee. The packet received correctly. Yes, correct. It's not just you identify the packet with them. No, it's it's like the upper layer packet reception. So you decode it, everything is right. That's when you say it's received. So uh, coming to the second part, so uh, some of the tools that we developed uh, as a part of this work, uh, the, the combining factor of all the tools is uh, reusing the OML uh, framework that, uh, that runs the orbit grid. So the, the way it works is we have a number of monitoring nodes uh, on, the, on the box on the right. You have each of these monitoring nodes which does different kinds of things. For example, the Wi-Fi monitoring node. 
measures uh, from in promiscuous mode all the packets that it receives over Wi-Fi and a Bluetooth uh, node does a similar thing. A Zigbee node might capture all the Zigbee packets that are going over there. And there are all the uh, the nodes in the present already in the environment, which are node one, node two, and so on. So uh, all these monitoring nodes uh, we envision as being synchronized uh, since they are controlled by a central controller. Uh, and the, the experiment controller then uh, controls the, the timings essentially of all these monitoring nodes. And after they have collected their respective data sets, they send that data to the, uh, to the database using the OML uh, framework, which is essentially a SQML reduced uh, functionality, uh, sim more simpler kind of a database uh, interact interaction language. And we port that info into a uh, diagnosis uh, algorithm uh, part. So for now, this uh, inference algorithm part is a simple C++ code, which, which uh, uh, periodically reads from this database and uh, based on simple rules, it gives out judgments of what uh, is the uh, what is the interference present in the current uh, environment. So uh, the the main topics of uh, interest were here were how to time synchronize these different monitoring nodes, and we haven't been able to completely do that for uh, all the possible sets of monitors because of the inherent uh, differences in which in the way they capture these traces. Uh, and lastly, we look at some uh, trace, uh, some algorithms that uh, we use. So, coming to more details of the, the capturing te techniques. So, this is a snapshot of the 802.11 sniffing that we do online uh, from an orbit node. So, the way uh, the some of the relevant parameters that it collects is uh, it makes a table of this sort for each link that it sees. And uh, it time time bins the the receptions in, in terms of uh, preset uh, intervals. So in this case, it was 0.1 second. So it says from 1.2 second to 1.3 second, there was uh, activity on this link one, which had this source mag, this destination mag, and the rate of transmission was a certain 12 Mbps. There was this frequency. Uh, the channel occupancy uh, is an important parameter that we derive uh, from the activity, which is defined by the rate into the total bits uh, divided by the window of time that we are looking at. So, how do you time synchronize and what is the resolution? So, essentially, uh, uh, time synchronization uh, we do only for. Uh, things that operate uh, on similar kind of a framework, which is uh, 802.11 and the Zigbee nodes. Uh, for Bluetooth, we'll, we'll come to see that we we use the uh, new radio, uh, USRP2 uh, setup for that. So we haven't been able to synchronize the, the new radio uh, spectrum captures with this kind of a uh, time scale. And for um, for the Zigbee Bluetooth case, the time synchronization is uh, within computational error only because it's running on the same uh, process uh, using uh, a NTP kind of a uh, interface. So it's you mean Wi-Fi and Bluetooth? Yeah, Wi-Fi and Zigbee. We are doing uh, using Orbit nodes itself, and uh, the the Bluetooth thing we are doing using a USRP2. So that part is not uh, synchronized. But uh, we'll see that we can uh, use some other secondary means of synchronization uh, by seeing the packets, uh, by, by seeing events from these two viewpoints and then synchronizing those two events uh, in the two viewpoints. So essentially, if you have a Wi-Fi packet transmission, you'll see that on this monitor, and you'll also see that on the spectrum uh, sensing uh, node, and you will try to synchronize the start times so that uh, the rest of the frame is matching. So we haven't really done the, that. What is the MTP resolution? 
I mean, when you use NTP, you can say you're synchronized at one second or one minute? Or? So I think it's, uh, uh, in, in, in terms of milliseconds, uh, as far as I remember, it's uh, 20 milliseconds or, or similar number, some hundreds of milliseconds at least. And uh, similarly, for Bluetooth, we do have a way of uh, uh, capturing Bluetooth uh, packets. Uh, so uh, here we should emphasize that the, the nature in which Bluetooth transmits is, is uh, that nature makes it hard to capture all the Bluetooth packets uh, if you are not the intended receiver. Because Bluetooth hops its uh, frequency every 625 microsecond. Uh, uh, and the, the hopping pattern is known only to the transmitting and receiving sites. Uh, even then, there is a, a, a commercial device from Frontline. Uh, it sells for $10,000, by the way. Uh, and that uh, hacks into uh, uh, the, the ex message exchanges when the PicoNet is, the Bluetooth PicoNet is being established. And it uh, then finds out the hopping pattern, and then it goes to each uh, hop and then captures the packet. So the, in, in that kind of a way, we, we do get this kind of uh, table. Uh, and uh, this particular snapshot, by the way, was not from the $10,000 device, but we found a, a, a kind of a hack in which you can turn any $10 Bluetooth uh, dongle into this device because uh, you can essentially reprogram your Bluetooth dongle into doing the same thing as what they are doing. So it's it's going into the gray areas of le gray areas of legality uh, if you do that because we are essentially stealing their code and and writing it on our own firmware. So we can do that and uh, we were able to get some uh, packet captures, but uh, to do it in a more uh, <clears throat> a general way for Bluetooth is is by uh, using this idea of uh, uh, low cost spectrum analyzer capture. So here we use a USRP2 radio. We capture a uh, eight megahertz uh, 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 spect uh, frequency time axis uh, viewpoint, uh, where the color of the graph obviously is the uh, is the uh, power at which uh, the transmission was operating and here we see certain uh, small uh, 1 megahertz wide uh, packets and we know that we know how Bluetooth packet should look like. So we feature out the 1 megahertz uh, events from this spectrum uh, picture and uh, we isolate, isolate those 1 megahertz uh, uh, events essentially. And uh, we also do a second order uh, uh, function on that in which we identify whether there were multiple PicoNets present in the in the spectrum or not. So just by looking at this, we cannot say whether the, all the packets were from one uh, transmission of Bluetooth or whether there were multiple transmitting uh, links. Uh, so we have done a, a kind of a time binning approach for that uh, in which we know that uh, all the uh, transmissions from the same uh, source has to be synchronized using the periodicity of the Bluetooth standard. So for example, there, in this particular case, there were three PicoNets, three essentially Bluetooth links uh, that were there in the same area. And uh, so the, 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 red, the red PicoNet, uh, for example, can transmit at a certain time, say around 200 uh, uh, milliseconds, that you can see that. And the next time it, we get a capture of that uh, transmission has to be an integer multiple of the 625 microsecond uh, that's specified by Bluetooth because it can only operate on, on a integer uh, intervals of the this uh, time uh, this default time. Uh, but if you look at some other PicoNets, there is a high chance that those will not be synchronized to your uh, time uh, time interval. So if you measure the distance between the starting times of 
pico net 1 and pico net 2, then there is a non-integer multiple of that 625 microsecond interval. So here we timed in the starting times in terms of 20 microseconds each and we classify all the uh, pico, all the transmissions which have a integer multiple of one another as being in from as being from the same source and and for using this kind of technique we identify three sources in this particular graph and we had uh, three so we could uh, see all the different sources in so this. where are these new radios placed so so in this case I haven't uh, shown that but uh, so essentially uh, they there are three Bluetooth links in this experiment. Uh, each link is four meters apart and the GNU radio is in, at the center of the whole thing. So it sees uh, all the links taking place, all the transmissions. <coughs> so if you're going to use something like this, right? In a SOHO or whatever you need to talk about. So you're just going to throw a bunch of these new radios around and then they sort of figure out what's going on? So the idea is not to have the full functionality of the new radio uh, USRP because we don't need probably that much uh, from this kind of monitoring. But we can have, uh, for example, a $100 Wi-Fi, uh, sorry, 2.4 gigahertz spectrum analyzer. And that's like a USB stick. So if you push that in, that essentially gives you a similar picture. Yeah, but what I'm asking you is it seems like this picture is very dependent on where this thing is sitting. Right? Yeah, so you can sense, but it's you sense local to where you are. So therefore I think this picture that you're showing sort of is not really addressing that issue. How sensitive or you know, suppose I move that USRP radio that you have, the scanner or this uh, sensing device you have, like ten meters away. How will this picture look? I think that's useful to find out. Yeah. Uh, because this is not showing sort of the, 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 the sensitivity or the robustness to that. Because this is saying I kept it in the middle, it seems like you get pretty good signals from all of them, so you have something like this. But a lot of times I don't think you know where devices are. So therefore I think it might be useful to sort of understand. So yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. So we actually uh, did some sort of experiments regarding that and also um, uh, problem with this approach is if there is a Wi-Fi transmission going on then the since the Wi-Fi transmissions are, uh, are at a much higher power than the Bluetooth uh, we see a uh, over, overwhelming red in the picture because if, if that's near to you then you can't really capture the low power devices which are at a distance. So the, pro the some of the ways in which we can address these is uh, you <coughs> when you when you sense a certain spectrum, if you don't see any features or if, if it's a uniformly high powered kind of a picture, then you, you can also, you have the flexibility to move around in frequency. Now, you might argue for having multiple sensors and there, there can be a study of how many sensors are required to cover a certain geographic location, but we didn't uh, cover that aspect, but essentially, what we can do to tackle uh, uh, these things is we can move to uh, <coughs> um, less uh, popular uh, part of the frequency spectrum and s still see the same Bluetooth pattern because Bluetooth essentially hops over the entire 80 megahertz and if it's there in the extreme end you can assume that it's also there in the crowded part as well. So you can infer uh, some of that. Uh, and uh, as far as the power is concerned, one good thing is that uh, it only requires relative power. So relative to your noise, which is the green, yellow kind of a thing, you need some power. So it's it's uh, robust in the sense of the received power, but we, we should do some uh, testings, uh, some tests regarding the, the exact thresholds at which it fails to give us a good picture. So lastly coming to some uh, diagnosis algorithm aspects. Uh, so essentially to recap what we have is, is at least what we hope to get eventually is, uh, is this time synchronized uh, viewpoint from multiple uh, uh, 
multiple da uh, databases. So there could be different uh, databases of the same kind, or there could be uh, Zigbee, Wi-Fi, uh, different kind of radios which give you this the set of tables. And these, uh, if we have that viewpoint from these time synchronized databases, what we can do in in at least the simple uh, sense is, for example, if you see a drop in the Wi-Fi data rate, as and that synchronized with the start of your Bluetooth uh, capturing, uh, so you see a Bluetooth uh, transmissions in your spectrum analyzer starting at a certain time and your rate on your uh, Wi-Fi falls down around the same time. Then these are, you can obviously say that these two things are uh, correlated uh, and you can diagnose that this is the problem with your transmission or in, in some other case if you see, we observe that uh, uh, there is a uh, adjacent channel uh, transmissions uh, for Wi-Fi, if you are transmitting on certain Wi-Fi channel, if there is on, on the very next channel, if there is another transmission going on, then the number of MAC level retries goes up. So you measure the, that parameter when you are measuring the captures and you you can say that as the MAC retries are going up, this is due to a, a adjacent channel transmissions and so on. To, you know, uh, one uh, concrete example, we did this uh, detailed uh, case study for uh, 802.11g video stream. So this is this was more uh, influenced by the application that Infosys had in mind. So uh, if you have a video stream uh, from your access point, in this case to your uh, TV, we want to characterize what are some of the simple interference uh, scenarios that can be occurring in a normal regular home and can we characterize each of these uh, uh, interferences into distinct regions that we can uh, uh, we can classify in terms of a set of observable parameters. In this case, we have uh, all these uh, extra links. So your own AP could be transmitting to two other uh, devices and there could be two other neighboring APs that are there in the in the neighborhood. And there's also a Bluetooth uh, transmitter which is near to the receiver of the uh, Wi-Fi link. So channel congestion, so these are the four types of interferences that we are considering in this scenario. Channel congestion we call when um, all the Wi-Fi links, that's link one. So link one is the video link which is always transmitting at 15 Mbps constant bitrate uh, video. Uh, using a VLC uh, player, we emulated this kind of a uh, traffic model. Uh, so the other links we vary uh, and we come up with these four different kinds of scenarios. So in case of channel congestion, we make all the Wi-Fi links transmit <coughs> with a offered load of 15 Mbps. Uh, so, and since they are obviously in the same radio range, uh, the channel capacity of that uh, particular 802.11 channel is not uh, enough to satisfy all the offered load. So there is a, a drop in throughput obviously for your video link and we characterize that uh, using uh, uh, a set of two parameters that will come to later. But first, so this was the channel congestion. Uh, the second interference type that, that we characterize is a slow link on the same AP. Uh, this goes back to the first example that I showed uh, in which uh, if there is a second transmission which is slower, uh, which is at a slower rate, then that transmission affects your uh, video transmission in this case. Uh, so in this case, we uh, uh, characterize this interference by using link 2. So on the same AP, link 2 is transmitting on a 1 Mbps uh, uh, data rate and your video link is still on, uh, using, uh, doing its usual stuff. Uh, the third case is that slow link is on another access point. So in this case, it's access in link four, which is transmitting at uh, one Mbps. And the final Bluetooth interference case, link six, six is on, and that is transmitting a five and, five and two kbps uh, uh, TCP kind of a data. So, <clears throat> 
the aim, the, the final outcome of this is we identified two parameters from a uh, Wi-Fi, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, the way we are monitoring this is through a 802.11 uh, uh, packet capturing node, uh, which is uh, present uh, in the uh, <coughs> locality. So uh, that's only a 802.11 uh, viewpoint of the whole system. And from just that one viewpoint, we identified two relevant parameters. Uh, one is the link occupancy, and the other is the percentage retransmissions. That's plotted on the two axes here. So on the basis of these two parameters, we can characterize at least these four simple cases of interferences. Uh, and the, the, the dashed lines here are uh, the 90% threshold. So each time we do an experiment of a certain kind, so if you are doing a Bluetooth interference uh, experiment in that scenario, we, uh, we plot the retransmission <coughs> percentage and the link occupancy as a point in this two axis graph. And uh, each time we, uh, we do this, we measure, uh, we, 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 uh, we have one new data point in this uh, axis and the lines that we observe is the 90% thresholds. What it means is 90% of the time, uh, Bluetooth transmissions uh, were observed in in the upper right corner of that uh, in that graph, uh, and so on uh, for all the congestion case, the slow link case, and the slow link same AP case. Uh, the way we are labeling these points are is in terms of the nominal uh, values for the same parameters. So. If there was no other transmission going on, if there was only that video link, then this is the baseline case. So this is the amount of uh, link occupancy that you should have seen, and this is the amount of retransmissions that is nominally there, uh, averaging over 10 runs of 180, sec 180 seconds each. So nominally, this is what this is the point that you should see now. Uh, by this online measurement, if you actually see that uh, the retransmission point is all the way to the right, uh, then the, you have two cases in which you then go and observe the link occupancy. If the link occupancy is low, then you can say it's a congestion kind of environment. Whereas in case of Bluetooth, we observe that the link occupancy uh, is more. This this essentially. Uh, brings us uh, closer to our goal of uh, online passive diagnosis. Just observe these two axes or in some cases, if you have, if you add more interference examples, you will need more axes to classify this kind of interference and, uh, and the aim is essentially to separate out these regions of interest and label each one with a certain level of confidence as a certain kind of interference. Uh, to go into the reason why why this kind of a picture is observed, uh, can get some intuitive idea as to when Bluetooth is <coughs> interfering. What essentially happens is uh, uh, your packet that you are a uh, 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 streaming video packet gets corrupted, and and since it's a, uh, a narrow bandwidth kind of a interference, uh, the next time you you uh, kind of sense the channel, it's free, but uh, so you retransmit almost immediately. So the number of transmissions required increases and that increases the, the, the link occupancy of the channel a little bit. So, so what's the definition of link occupancy? Link occupancy is, uh, uh, is essentially the, the fraction of time that the link was being used for transmission. If you are uh, observing in time slots uh, of say 0.1 seconds, then we are measuring for what fraction of that 0.1 second was your link, your video link transmitting. So it's uh, just the video link. Yeah, it's only the video link that we are observing. So, 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 
What is the video link? What do you use for the video? So for that, we have a constant bit rate uh, uh, for the orbit uh, node. We start a VLC player, uh, which streams a constant bit rate video, 15 Mbps uh, video, to another uh, VLC player, which is located on the uh, orbit node, on the receiving orbit node. So that's no, uh, is there ACK, ACK, ACK? No, it's over UDP. Over UDP. Yeah. That's, uh, there's no. So, so essentially, we are only uh, we only are capturing the MAC level uh, in, uh, info, and not the higher level transport level re retransmissions. Uh, so, uh, and similarly, the the retransmission percentage increases to a large amount. So, if RB was the nominal retransmission percentage. Uh, Due to noise or or the background uh, uh, transmissions, uh, then that increases uh, up to a five. Uh, uh, we observe up to a five-fold increase in that percentage retransmission in case of Bluetooth transmissions, and up to three to even more seven times the the retransmissions in case of congestion. When when there are multiple. Uh, uh, Wi-Fi links, Wi-Fi devices transmitting. We, there, there is some past study on uh, on the amount of retransmission that you are supposed to observe. That's the Bianchi's model essentially. So, uh, characterizing that, we have some idea on how to characterize that. And similarly, for low, uh, for a slow link kind of interference, we observe that we can get these thresholds which separate these two regions. Uh, the, the idea is we can develop this further into a more rigorous analysis of what these thresholds need to be in case of uh, a real world environment. Uh, so you did, you actually did this experiment, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so what kind of numbers did you get for the baseline? So the baseline in case of uh, uh, this link occupancy uh, for the 15 Mbps was around uh, 0 0.3. That's the that was the occupancy of that link. Thirty uh, percent of thirty percent of the time it was uh, transmitting as a baseline, and retransmission was about four to five percent in the baseline case. So in the baseline, you get due to some channel noise, you need to retransmit four percent of the uh, package. I think it was channel noise that maybe about 4% retransmission. So, channel noise plus the ambient uh, environment, which we also characterize. So, when we have... Oh, okay, but the environment is kind of a vague statement. No, uh, so let me make it more clear by saying that when we characterize, uh, the, when, what we call as nominal is when uh, these links, these other links are also on, but they translate a 1 Mbps offered load at full transmission speed. So we wanted to characterize kind of a uh, normal environment in which you can never have one link uh, transmitting, right? Like you cannot really make your uh, thresholds based on the assumption that you can at some point ha measure this only one link going on in the world. So, so, so in, in terms of this picture, what's the definition of nominal? So nominal is uh, when video link one is operating at 15 Mbps, Link 2, 3, 4, and 5 are operating at 1 Mbps uh, offered load at full 54 Mbps, 54 Mbps transmission, and 6 is off completely. So, no Bluetooth, but some Wi Fi kind of a, mm, that's like that, that's a part of the ambient environment in some sense that we characterize. So that's so, so the question is then in the ambient environment, what gave you four or five percent uh, retransmission rate? That's uh, due to some of the packets that collide uh, from multiple uh, Wi-Fi transmitters. It's exciting. It's, it's collisions among the. It's not ambient. It's not really receiver noise or. No, but uh, so we also did some case. It's never zero. That that's what we observed. That even if you have, if you don't have any other Wi-Fi transmissions, there is uh, depending on the distance between transmitter and receiver, there's always a certain 
uh, uh, retransmission that you observe. Uh, if you have no other things, those values are uh, about 2 to 3 percent. But if you have some, uh, and we, there is a theoretical kind of a model for that retransmission percentage that was given by Bianchi. Uh, so uh, there, there's a plot of, as you increase the number of uh, transmitters, what is the percentage retransmission that you should nominally observe. And the point there was that if you have Bluetooth, then that percentage uh, jumps a lot, which goes beyond the normal case of uh, uh, only Wi-Fi kind of a transmitters. So, okay. yeah, my, my, my question would be like measuring link occupancy to be about 1.2, about something sounds, uh, the question is what's the robustness of that? So that's, that's something that we have been working on uh, since, uh, so, Remember, we this this uh, thresholds effectively depend on the uh, the link that you are observing, the distances that there are in the scenario, and so on. So that's why the thresh the thresholds we have set as as uh, multiples of the nominal and not as absolute number. So we can't say that if you observe more than uh, 50 percent uh, of the time the link is occupied you can say that there is there is some problem because it could be that your main link itself is consuming 50 percent of the the channel so, so that's why uh, the link occupancy thresholds are relative to the the main link so if you have a certain link which should nominally transmit using a, a certain occupancy ratio if, if the occupancy ratio increases to a certain extent, then we can say there is a certain problem. Or if it decreases, then we can say a, there is a certain problem. So that's why we are characterizing in in terms of the nominal. So so, uh, so in terms of that nominal thing, the only thing you change from nominal was having the Bluetooth on or off. In in the Bluetooth interference case. Right. So so each time you turn the Bluetooth on or off. You should have a uh, a data point yeah. here, right? So yeah. you have a collection of data point. I mean, this is kind of a conceptual picture, right? Yeah. So I let's, let's go to the, the results picture. I don't really have the the individual data points uh, here. Uh, one of the reasons is we we do this uh, some of the times that we collect this something goes wrong in the sense that we see this uh, point all the way over here and then we have to s go and and uh, well, say that of, in terms of data collection it's kind of instructive yeah but uh, we and want to isolate those points like this, right? huh? so we wanted to isolate those points which were not from one of these four cases so so people call them you know they people call them you, you know in just in general terms those are outliers right something where you believe something went wrong but it's kind of be nice to see your your outliers and your your kind of clouds of data points that signal different modes i mean um, we spend a lot of time talking about this slide without showing it yeah uh, i should have probably had the x marks or something you know, so why why you spent like 15 minutes on this conceptual picture without without yeah. actually using it then <laughs> Anyway, so let's keep going. So uh, finally, uh, uh, summarizing some of the things we did, uh, uh, we had uh, three phases in our project over time, essentially. Firstly, we observed what are the qualitative, quantitative throughput uh, numbers in when we have these interference cases. We studied a lot of different cases in which we have 802.11 Wi-Fi, uh, Bluetooth, Bluetooth, Zigbee, Zigbee, 802.11, what we wanted to get a feel of what is the the impact numbers, is it even relevant to to uh, study the impacts or is it too less to worry about and those kind of scenarios and what are the troublesome uh, cases, for example, if it's a co-located 
transmitters, then you have a heavy impact, things like that. Uh, the second phase we developed and reused some of the existing tools uh, that we have in terms of capturing the wireless environment. We we used the 802.11 Wi-Fi capturing mode. We came up with some new uh, things for Bluetooth uh, spectrum uh, monitoring cases. We had a, a Zigbee uh, face capture uh, code written in with, with the help of the Zigbee Tiny OS framework. And we merged kind of these things into the OML. So right now we have a online system in which uh, at least for the 802.11, as you are observing these parameters, you can do, you can capture a, a preset number of parameters, and you can then go on to the diagnosis uh, phase of the project in which you, in which you, uh, to start with, in the simple cases, you set thresholds for each parameter, and you say that if these parameters go above or below these thresholds you infer a certain um, cases, but uh, going forward, we can uh, we can build up more in, uh, interesting uh, diagnostic algorithms in which you actually uh, not only have a threshold-based uh, decisions, but you also have a more uh, uh, more detailed kind of a inference in which you actually go and observe the events. So if you observe that event A. Uh, which which could be uh, increase in the uh, uh, the packet losses of a certain uh, link if, if event A occurs whenever event B occurs on another uh, uh, wife, a Bluetooth link then we can uh, do a correlation analysis uh, in which we uh, every time these two events occur uh, approximately the same time we give it a certain um, uh, correlation factor, so a confidence factor. So, and over time we can say that uh, if these two events uh, are occurring at the same time, they are, uh, they are correlated in some sense and we can build up more uh, detailed frameworks for that and we can have more uh, uh, fine-grained uh, data mining uh, techniques in which just by looking at one viewpoint we can go and analyze the 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 variation of these parameters and and identify in, in different cases what do these things look like and come up with more uh, intuitive uh, actually less intuitive but more useful uh, ways of characterizing interference so these are some things we are doing and we hope to do essentially. I think that's some of the references.